Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium. Episode 81A, Charlemagne and Leo. Today we begin our end-of-the-century tour by heading west to Italy and the realm of the Franks beyond. So far in our story, the Western kingdoms have operated in the shadow of the Roman Empire, both the one which fell and the one which survived. The vast majority of people living in Western Europe in 476 AD were Roman Christians. Their way of life came to shape some of the behaviour of their new overlords, and one of the political realities of this was that everyone knew there had once been an emperor, and now there were merely several kings. Constantinople was a distant place to many, but its preeminence was not seriously questioned. When Byzantine ambassadors appeared, they still carried themselves like masters of the universe. They dressed better than Westerners, they spoke in flowing Greek, they followed arcane ceremonial practices which seemed to convey the ancientness and legitimacy of their world. Western ambassadors, meanwhile, returned to their kings, reporting that Constantinople was a city like no other. The Roman Empire was alive and well on the Bosphorus, and we would do well to pay them respect. 300 years, though, is a long time. The shadow had receded. New hybrid identities and languages had formed in the West, and despite Justinian's best efforts direct Byzantine influence, was very limited. Our 8th century narrative has been all about Byzantium coming to terms with the reality of the rise of the Caliphate. A similar story played out in the West, but with the opposite trajectory. To the Franks, the rise of the Arabs saw their rivals crumble. The Byzantine position in Italy collapsed, and the Visigothic kingdom in Spain was destroyed. Only the Franks remained, and they would soon fill the vacuum with increasing vigour. Sandwiched between the sunrise in the west and the sunset in the east were the popes in Rome. Intimately aware of the changing political situation, the pontiffs would eventually side with their neighbours across the Alps. The west was about to step out of the shadow of the Roman past. You may remember that in 700 AD, the Franks were a divided realm. Noble families had managed to undermine royal authority by building their own local power bases across the future France and Germany. By 800 AD, the kingdom of the Franks had doubled in size. Its borders stretched from Denmark and Holland in the north down to Barcelona and Rome in the south. It had one king, the hugely powerful Charlemagne, who on Christmas Day was crowned Emperor of the Romans. To explain this transformation, let's begin with two important differences between the Franks and the Byzantines. Taxation and inheritance. As I've mentioned before, taxation is not popular, but it may have saved the Roman Empire. Despite all those catastrophic defeats across the 7th century, the bureaucrats in Constantinople could still find men to deliver a tax bill to your door. That money was then used to pay the army. The Arabs might have won all the important battles, but they were never able to set up camp in Anatolia and conquer it. There was always a Byzantine force lurking over the next hill, ready, waiting for their guard to drop. It's not just the money that's important in this situation either. It's the fact that the tax was centrally collected and centrally spent. In other words, the empire's generals followed orders because they believed that obedience to Constantinople was the key to their next paycheck. If instead the tax was collected locally and spent on local defence, then what might have happened is that each region could have looked out for themselves. So Cilicia or Cappadocia might have negotiated their own surrender and made life easier for the invading Arabs who could concentrate their attacks on Constantinople. 
That kind of regional authority is what we find in the realm of the Franks. You can follow all of this on the map for today's episode. Just check Facebook, Twitter, or the website. As you can see, there were plenty of regions with their own identity and political elite. Last century, we talked about uh, Neustria and Austrasia, based around Paris and Cologne, respectively. But to the south, there was Aquitaine, Burgundy, Bavaria, Provence, and so on. The Franks had largely done away with direct taxation. Instead, the king granted land to his vassals in exchange for their military service. This supplied men with farms and peasants to work them, which could feed and supply their retinue. When the king called for them, they would don their armour and march off to war. In theory, this system worked fine, as France is a big place, but human beings tend to spend their time working out how they can best increase their cash flow and avoid their responsibilities. So the nobles built up their power to the point where local alliances were strong enough to resist the king's demands and force concessions from him. He couldn't easily crush them because he had to rely on other noble families marching to his aid. And if they sensed weakness, then they might try to get out of their own obligations. Without direct taxation, the power of the king was limited. This situation was made even less promising from a royal perspective by the Germanic custom of split inheritance. Over in Byzantium, the emperor usually left the crown to his eldest son. There were exceptions, but it was generally agreed that one man must be in charge, as civil war is so disastrous. The Franks, however, obeyed their ancient customs and continued to divide their estates between their sons. This included the kingdom itself, which is why rival courts like Austrasia and Neustria developed. This further weakened royal power when the nobles could play off one royal against another. This situation contributed to the decline of the Merovingian dynasty, who were still in power in 700 AD. Real authority had devolved onto the mayors of the palace, the strongmen who administered the kingdoms. They had slowly reduced the Merovingians to the status of figurehead, while they led the armies themselves. Those mayors, of course, began to consider whether they could do away with the figureheads and become royal themselves. This is what led to the rise of the Carolingian dynasty, who would replace the Merovingians in the mid-8th century. The man who got the ball rolling was Charles Martel, the Hammer, as he became known. He was mayor of the Austrasian palace and emerged as the leading man in the realm after a civil war, which took place at about the same time as the great siege of Constantinople. Charles was an adept and forceful military commander, as his nickname implies. His father had united the realm under one figurehead monarch, and had begun trying to subjugate the powerful noble families. This project was to be Charles's life work. The way he would accomplish this was to campaign every summer. He would call for his vassals to come join him. Those that did would be rewarded with new lands and titles. Those that didn't would see the royal army at their gates the next summer, demanding to know why they were shirking their responsibilities. Only by constantly affirming the king's rights could Charles force the noble families to come to heel. In the first decade of his rule, he marched against the Frisians, the Bavarians, and the Alamanni. Each was forced to acknowledge his duties and send men to join the campaigns. He also led an attack on the still pagan Saxons in the east who had raided the realm during the civil war. These campaigns were all in the Frankish heartlands. In the 730s, Charles moved south to deal with the growing threat from Arab raiders. As you know, the kingdom of the Visigoths in Spain had fallen swiftly to the advancing caliphate after their opening battle in 711. By the 730s, the Arabs were making regular forays across the Pyrenees into the realm of the Franks. In 732, at the Battle of Tours, 
Charles supposedly smashed the Muslim force, putting paid to their plans for further conquest. Modern historians seriously doubt that this was the mighty conflict between East and West that it has sometimes been portrayed as. There may never even have been a specific pitched battle. The Caliphate's men would continue to operate on Frankish land for many years to come, but Charles's military machine made sure that their raids never grew into a serious threat. The Hammer deserves a huge amount of credit for the rise of the Carolingians. He almost never lost a battle, which was key to his ability to force the elites into line. And his corps of veteran soldiers created a strong, experienced army that no other power in the region could match. In 737, Charles's puppet, King Thuderic IV, passed away. Charles did not appoint a new king, and still hadn't upon his death four years later. The realm passed to his three sons, who quickly proclaimed a king of their own, Childeric III. Their thought being that the people could all remain loyal to one king, even if the realm was again divided between several mayors of the palace. However, the most ruthless of the three, Pippin III, soon took sole power for himself. He was able to continue his father's work and keep the army united under one leader. But Pippin remained concerned about dynastic squabbles and how they might undermine his authority. Charles had clearly considered whether or not he could rule without a king, so Pippin took this idea to its logical conclusion and made himself king in 751. There would be no more need for pretense or debate. The man in charge is also your royal sovereign. Pippin had himself crowned by the Archbishop of Mainz that year and became the first king of what would become known as the Carolingian dynasty. But circumstances allowed him an even grander coronation when three years later, Pope Stephen II crossed the Alps in person and agreed to crown him again. This was an important symbolic occasion for Pippin. The Frankish nobility knew that this self-aggrandizement was just that, self-created. Everyone knew that the Merovingians were not the holders of real power anymore, but their lineage did stretch back to the time of Clovis, and so their right to be seen as royal was still understood. Pippin could now point to the popes of Rome and say, there's my legitimacy. The heirs of St. Peter have seen fit to support my claim. Of course, Stephen wasn't there because he thought Pippin looked spiffy in his robes. He was there because the Lombards had captured Ravenna and were now demanding tribute from Rome just to maintain its independence. Pippin was happy to honour his side of the agreement and as I mentioned back in episode 75, the Franks twice besieged Pavia to ensure that the Lombards left Rome alone. Pippin went back to campaigning within his realm. The north was largely secure, and so he spent his time in the south, subduing Septimania and ejecting a few more Arab raiders. He then began a bitter war with the largest remaining sub-kingdom, that of Aquitaine, in 760. The eight-year war was a bloody affair, but reduced the nobles of the area to grudging loyalty by the time of Pippin's death in 768. This brings us to Pippin's son, Charles. Charles Magnus, as he was known, Charles the Great. He was given this title to distinguish him from his own son, Charles, but it didn't take long for the name to acquire a new meaning. Charlemagne was a tall, powerful and charismatic figure who took naturally to life on campaign. He was also ruthless and utterly committed to extending Frankish power by military means. He put down a fresh uprising in Aquitaine in 769, then marched east against the pagan Saxons, sacking their major cult site and carrying much booty home. Charles was not alone yet. He had a brother, Carloman, who he didn't get on with. 
Fortunately, or perhaps deliberately, Carloman died two years into their joint reign. His children went to live with the Lombards at Pavia, who were once again threatening the Pope's position in Rome. Pope Adrian sent word to Charlemagne that he was in need of assistance, and Charles was more than happy to kill two birds with one siege. Against the advice of his court, Charlemagne brought a huge army to the gates of Pavia and stayed all winter. The surprised Lombard king, Desiderius, was forced to submit in spring 774, and his line was extinguished. Instead of installing a puppet to rule, Charles decided that he was now king of the Franks and Lombards. His brother's children disappeared at about the same time. The Lombard kingdom was fairly centralised, and so the nobles of North Italy bent the knee to their new lord. This was a momentous extension of Frankish authority, and Charlemagne was determined to maintain it. Two years later, a revolt broke out centred on the Duchy of Spoleto, one of the two southern Italian kingdoms that maintained independence from Pavia. The king came flying back into Italy, crushed the rebels, and annexed Spoleto into his realm. The dukes of Benevento clung fearfully to their independence in alliance with the Byzantines in the south. The capture of northern Italy was to have many long-term consequences, but in the short term, Charlemagne returned to his capital at Aachen with the Lombard royal treasury in tow. These piles of gold represented the wealth of formerly Byzantine Italy, and they now greatly enhanced Charles's prestige. He was able to offer gifts and prizes that stunned the courts of the West. Charlemagne had inherited a military system that had been honed and grooved for five decades. The Frankish nobles turned up loyally every spring, and their constant warfare meant there was no power to match them for hundreds of miles in any direction. It was to prove an unstoppable juggernaut. In a brutal series of campaigns, Charlemagne battered the Saxons into submission. In an infamous incident, he had four and a half thousand prisoners executed, after a rebellion broke out. The Saxons were not only incorporated into the realm, but they were converted to Christianity at the point of a sword. Their lands would slowly become like any other in the realm, with dukes and bishops and the rest. This brought the borders of the Frankish world deep into modern Germany, altering the political landscape of Central Europe as they went. To the south, the Bavarians, for a long time an independent political unit, were forced to become just another county. Their ruling dynasty disinherited. This brought Charlemagne into contact with the Slav tribes on the eastern Bavarian border. They were offered the chance to pay protection money for the pleasure of being Charles's neighbour. The Slav tribes were torn because on their eastern border was another empire making similar demands – our old friends, the Avars. Since the siege of 626, Avar power had dwindled to the point where their command didn't extend very far beyond the future Hungarian plain. However, they still ruled the roost there, and they weren't going to roll over in the face of Frankish aggression. The men from the steppes saddled up and raided Bavaria in 788 to show Charlemagne who was boss. Big mistake. Charlemagne marched down the Danube and smashed the Avars. Twice his forces sacked their capital, while a Lombard army was sent to raid from the south as well. After a decade of on-and-off warfare, the Avar Khanate was wiped from the map. Those in the west became Frankish vassals, while in the east the Bulgars took advantage of the situation to expand their territory. Again, Charlemagne carted home wagon loads of treasure from his victories. The hordes of Avar gold were, of course, largely extorted from Constantinople. Now it would be passed around the grateful nobles of the West, who had begun to think they were living in a golden age. Only in Spain did Charlemagne suffer defeat by Arab forces and their Basque allies, though even there he managed to carve out a Spanish province based around Barcelona. 
Charles had completely redrawn the map of Western Europe. He controlled an army that was stronger than any which had operated there for 400 years. He gathered the greatest intellectuals of the age at Aachen. They began copying books, creating education programs, and glorifying their benefactor. They helped him write royal legislation on a number of topics which would begin to shape the lives of thousands of new subjects. Most relevantly for the history of Byzantium, Charlemagne empowered the Frankish church. This process had begun under Pippin. He had been keen to legitimise his rule by associating it with the church's authority. This had encouraged a series of church councils whose enactments were soon absorbed into royal legislation. Charlemagne's great annexations forced the church to convene many more gatherings to administer the new souls being brought into the fold. We'll pause the Frankish story here in 794 as a church council gathers in Frankfurt. One of the major issues to be discussed was Irene's ecumenical council of 787 and its restoration of the icons. We must now bring the story of the papacy up to date. I haven't really talked about the domestic political situation of the popes before. When the Lombards arrived in Italy, the city of Rome was physically isolated from Ravenna in the north and Naples in the south. We are talking about a couple of hundred miles of territory with many small towns and lots of farmland, but understandably, the people living there felt surrounded and under threat. What happened to this Roman society was quite similar to what took place in Byzantium after the Arabs arrived. The local nobility became entirely militarised. Defending the borders was the focus of their existence. The settlement of people began to be based around fortified strongholds rather than the abundance of farmland. This new military aristocracy had strong views on how things should be run. But so did the Pope and his large bureaucratic staff in Rome. The Popes would rule, but the major families would influence their election. Because of the pontiff's stature and the physical distance between Rome and Ravenna, the Popes effectively became the exarch of their domain. He organised local tax collection, local defence, charity and public works. We've talked about iconoclasm being an identity crisis unique to the Byzantines. Only the people living in Anatolia and the Aegean really understood life under constant Arab attack, and so they came up with solutions unique to them. Over in Rome, a similar situation was underway. Their interests had begun to diverge from those of the emperors in Constantinople. The empire increasingly felt like a distant alien enterprise. The conversion of the Lombards to Catholic Christianity was an important step in this process. Suddenly, the relationship between the king of the Lombards and the papacy changed. Although he might still want to annex their territory, he had to treat the Pope with the respect due to the head of the church. This fueled a sense in Rome that the pontiff could deal with foreign kings on his own terms and might not need the emperor to intervene. Listener AX asked when Constantinople lost political control over Rome and when the Papal States came into existence. The answer to both questions is murky. I think you could plausibly answer that political control of Rome was lost back in 692 after Justinian II's Quinisext Council. If you'll recall, the Pope refused to recognise the council because many of its canons contradicted practices of the Roman Church. Justinian naturally ordered the exarch to have the Pope arrested, but the Italian troops refused to cooperate. Now, of course, neither side recognised this as a definitive break in relations. Justinian was soon swept away, and several of his successors were keen to gain recognition from the pontiff. The Pope, for his part, was not turning his back on imperial support either because of the threat of the Lombards. 
But in retrospect, this was the start of a collapse in the relationship between the Empire and its mother city. From our narrative episodes, you'll recognise the sequence of events which followed. After the siege of 717, the Emperor Leo announced his intention to raise taxes and take away the papal patrimonial estates across Italy. He would transform the Pope's various properties into regular taxable land. This, of course, hit at the heart of papal independence and was greatly resented. Gregory II could only respond, though, from within his small island of territory, and so he refused to obey orders or send any tax to Constantinople. Again, you could see this as the moment when Rome declared its independence from the empire, but neither side thought that at the time. It had just become clear that the emperor couldn't spare any more troops to enforce his will, and so the pope was in a position to resist. Relations worsened under Constantine V, who, as you know, took away the pope's jurisdiction over Balkan and Sicilian Christians and transferred their souls to the care of the patriarch. At the same time, the Lombards were becoming more aggressive, and in 751 they captured Ravenna, putting an end to the Exarchate. This was the worst of all scenarios for the papacy. The empire could no longer defend them against the growing power of Pavia. Hence why, in 751, Pope Stephen left the safety of Rome and took the risk of crossing the Alps to seek Pippin's aid. 754 is a doubly significant year for papal independence. By the time Stephen was back home, having crowned Pippin as king of the Franks, news had come from Constantinople that Constantine V's ecumenical council had banned the use of icons and images of living things. Stephen's rejection of that council did not see the Romans jumping for joy that they could chart this independent course. In fact, it made Stephen's successors paranoid that the Byzantines would eventually send a fleet up from Sicily to depose them. Meanwhile, the Lombards weren't going anywhere. The papacy felt just as hemmed in as ever and now had two unreliable and potentially dangerous sponsors instead of one. It was at some point during this time that a document was commissioned. It was to be one of the most famous forgeries ever written, the Donation of Constantine. The Constantine in question was the original, the first. The letter that was suddenly discovered was from the emperor to Pope Sylvester, who sat on the papal throne from 314 to 335. The letter thanked the Pope for healing Constantine of leprosy, as well as sharing much Christian wisdom. The Emperor was heading east to his new capital, and in gratitude he passed the care of the Western Empire to the Pontiff. Yes, from Hadrian's Wall to the Atlas Mountains, political authority was devolved to the care of Sylvester. Those who first heard of this discovery must have been suspicious, but within a generation or two it was easier to convince people that the letter was real and its implications serious. Whoever came up with this idea, their intention was clear, to provide the papacy with the legal authority to press its claim for independence and independent authority. It was a forgery written in a time of high anxiety. Rome sat precariously in the middle of a changing world. The most reliable path forward seemed to be the alliance with the Franks, but they might need reminding of Rome's special status so that they would choose to remain its protector. The arrival of Charlemagne in Italy in 774 gave Pope Hadrian a chance to apply some pressure. During the siege of the Lombard capital, Charles made his way down to Rome, and the two men greeted one another like the brothers in Christ that they were. But soon Hadrian was putting the spiritual screws to the king of the Franks. You see, when Pope Stephen crowned Pippin, he got the Frankish king to agree that the former lands of the Ravenna Exarchate should now become the Pope's property. 
Pippin agreed to this, despite the fact that Constantinople had made similar pleas. Pippin, though, had not enforced this gift, and the Lombards refused to give up the land. But now Charlemagne was king of the Franks and Lombards, and Hadrian wanted the son to honour the father's word. Charlemagne was no fool, though, and took his time in dealing with his new Italian lands, but eventually he conceded to the papacy's demands and granted them the territory around Ravenna, as well as expanding the domains of Rome in every direction. He even threw in some estates further south. This is the moment when I would suggest the papal states, as they became known, really came into existence. The expansion of territory gave the popes themselves many new clients and much more income to help them break free from control of the aristocracy that lived near the city. It had been a gradual process, but the papacy now had the wealth to run an independent territory. These donations were a massive boost to the wealth of Rome. And if there was any question about whether Aachen or Constantinople deserved more attention at this point, surely this answered it. Yet the Pope didn't really want either side to become too powerful. A weak Byzantium suited them, but a strong Francia? Hmm. Charlemagne's astonishing series of conquests posed a potential problem. Already the Frankish church councils were making pronouncements without fully consulting his holiness. The intellectuals at Aachen were talking about Charlemagne being favoured by God. What if he started dictating policy to the Pope? Hadrian was therefore pleased to hear about Irene's decision to reverse Constantine V's ecumenical council. With Byzantium restored to favour, perhaps some balance would return. Sadly, his hopes were dashed when Tarasius had his various requests edited out of the final draft of the council. Hadrian had of course asked for his estates and jurisdiction returned, but was ignored. Still, he supported the return to favouring icons, which brought the whole Catholic Church back into communion. Over in the realm of the Franks, though, the church had other ideas. Men really had been talking about Charlemagne as God's favourite. While the Byzantines went through an identity crisis in the face of constant defeat, the Franks' self-perception also altered in the face of constant victory. Already the words empire and emperor had been discussed. Surely those titles were more fitting for what Charlemagne had created. And more to the point, a king could be crowned by an archbishop, but an emperor would rule the church. When news of Irene's council reached Aachen, a decision was made to open it to the scrutiny of the Frankish church. Interestingly, Frankish theologians did not need a lot of prodding to disagree with the assertion that icons had always been a part of church tradition. In fact, the Franks were more sympathetic to the biblical basis of Constantine V's Council of 754. Unfortunately, the Latin translation of the Greek text was not accurate. That isn't that surprising given that the Greeks used specific technical terms to distinguish between the honouring of icons and the worship of icons – But there's also some suggestion that parts were deliberately mistranslated to help with the political aims of the Frankish court. Frankish theologians sent a report back to Hadrian, not only questioning the logic of Irene's council, but also questioning whether Irene, as a woman, had the right to convoke such a meeting, and whether Tarasius, a layman, should have been elevated to patriarch. Having just seen the church reunited, Hadrian was very alarmed to read this. He dashed off a point-by-point refutation of the Frankish criticism and rushed it back to Charlemagne to try and get everyone on the same page. But Charlemagne wasn't interested. Taking Hadrian's objections in stride, he convened the Synod of Frankfurt in 794, which roundly rejected 
the 787 Council as ecumenical. The Frankish Church refused to be bound by its decisions. Pope Hadrian died while his legates at the council were forced to accept these decisions, thus awkwardly putting the papacy in the position of supporting two opposing decisions. It seems that Charlemagne and his advisers were determined to demonstrate their parity with the Byzantines. Militarily, it was clear that this was the case. Not only had the Franks swept all before them, but in places like Venice and Benevento, where they came into direct contact with Byzantine troops, they were not impressed with what they saw. The king of the Franks and Lombards clearly felt that he should be subservient to no one. While the Byzantines were no real physical threat to his status, the fact that Irene could call an ecumenical council that supposedly reordered the whole of the Christian world was seen as a challenge. By attacking Irene's right to rule, Charlemagne was preparing the ground for his own seizure of the imperial title. In the legalistic world of Roman politics, the Frankish elite felt they were in a position to demonstrate that Byzantium had forfeited its right to supremacy. Charlemagne could present himself as following the more righteous theological position of Constantine V and maintaining church orthodoxy in his realm. Remember that innovation was equated with heresy, and so the presentation of continuity remained key. Back in Rome, the well-bred and well-connected Hadrian was followed by the far less pedigreed, Leo III. The partisans of Hadrian were unhappy with this election and agitated against the new man. Various accusations were directed at him, including adultery and perjury. In April 799, armed men tried to capture the pontiff in the streets, and in the scuffle, Leo escaped. His friends managed to smuggle him out of Rome, and he fled north to Charlemagne. We don't know what was said between king and pope at the meeting which followed, but the deal that seems to have been struck is that Charles would restore Leo and have the charges against him dismissed in exchange for the right to be crowned emperor of the Romans. And so it was that Frankish troops escorted Leo back to Rome shortly before King Charles made his way there to celebrate Christmas in the year 800 AD. The event itself was clearly stage-managed, because when the Pope placed the crown on Charles's head and declared him emperor, the congregation began to chant an official acclamation. After a 324-year absence, the West had a Roman emperor again. Phew, that's a lot of narrative to absorb. It was a far busier century from our point of view than previous ones. So I'm going to let you digest that story for a few days, and then I'll be back with episode 81b, where I will answer all of your questions and talk about how Charlemagne and Leo each tried to spin what had taken place. <laughs> 